when I had that little stint back in 2008 where I was winning club races again, I was flat out smoking. I was, <laughs> I was flat out smoking during that. So I remember waking up in the mornings having a smoke with my coffee, riding out to Glenvale, win the win A grade, ride home, double bang two smokes when I got home. <laughs> I was a disgrace. of Hilton Sons, Troy, has won it. Well, there you can see. He... Well, Troy, you seem pretty certain of victory there. Oh, I didn't really know I won it till about the finish straight. I was coming at him quicker than he was going, so and I knew I'd won it. So I just decided to put my hands up and enjoy the victory. Yeah, it was a nice victory salute there. Yeah, uh, something you dream of to put your hands up like that in a big race, and I just decided to do it on the spur of the moment. G'day good humans, today's vlog is going to be about an Australian cycling success story, uh, Troy Clark, if you live in Melbourne and you ride a bike you'll probably know who Troy Clark is. It's not so much about Troy's success on the bike but his ability to drag himself out of uh, depression and mental illness uh, after giving up cycling and uh, for those of you overseas that don't know who Troy is, he comes from a long line of famous cyclists in Australia. His father was an Olympian. His two brothers are professional cyclists. Troy himself won uh, several big races here in Australia, the Austral Wheel Race on the track, and uh, unfortunately had to give up the bike in 2000. Uh, stacked on a lot of weight, went into deep depression, and uh, this today's interview is about how he dragged himself out of that and uh, we thought we'd share this story because we understand there are a lot of people out there in similar situations and those people might be able to relate to his story and hopefully it motivates them to get some help and uh, I hope you enjoy this and uh, feel free to thank Troy in his on his social media I'll put the links in the description below. Here he is. How are you mate? How are you? Those things are right. Good. Where are we gonna go for coffee? Your call. Um, I reckon we go down to Richmond. Right. It's down there. There's a few cafes down there. Let's do it. Let's do it. I didn't give him, uh, he gave me half a lap head start pretty much. <laughs> Did he? Yeah. But that's alright, as a young kid, that's awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Stephen Pate, he took it out, I came second, Shane Kelly third. Shane Kelly, he was a, um, an absolute destroyer on the track, wasn't yeah. he? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's unbelievable. So good, mate. There's another angle there, down the bottom. Probably the end of primary school. Yeah. I was saying to Dad, Dad, I want to ride a bike. Yeah. And he's going, oh, shit. Yeah. Did he really? Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Um, so he made me join a football club first. I played footy for a bit, Dad. I still want to ride a bike. Oh, shit. He made me join a cricket club. Didn't really like that. He made me, he got, he made me do tennis lessons. And then eventually I said, Dad, I really want to ride a bike. He goes, oh, shit. And I remember one day he was coaching because his uh, stomping ground used to be Carnegie Velodrome. He'd train all the riders down there. Yeah. And at this one point he was actually training Kathy Watch before she went to the to Charlie Walsh. Yeah. And she was late for a session and her bike was sitting there. And I said, oh, can I jump on Kathy's bike and do a couple of laps? Yeah. And he goes, yeah, all right. And I remember, I remember this like it was yesterday. I did a sprint, went over the line, stopped pedaling. Yeah. I nearly bucked myself off the bike because it's a fixed gear. Yeah. Everyone, all the all the riders that he was coaching were cheering because I, I, I held it up. Yeah. But that was it. I said, Dad, I have to race. He goes, All right. Next thing I know, he's got me a bike, and we're going. I started off down at the Brunswick Clinic with yeah. Alan Grindle. Yeah, yeah. And that was it. I was hooked. Yeah. I think my breakthrough was pretty much '96, winning the Austral Wheel Race off 55 meters. Yep. And then. Yeah. The following year, I think I had a couple of wins, and then I was by 98, I was off scratch. Yeah. 
and racing the track there. Did a couple of seasons in America, yeah. racing their track seasons. Yeah. And then um, in the year 2000, I uh, still to this day don't know what happened. I got an injury, to, a nerve injury to one of my legs. Yeah. I remember coming home from America. I, I won a, a few very big uh, criteriums at the Tour of Ohio. It yeah. was a big amateur criterium series, and I pretty much got in a, the yes to, to sign a pro deal to go back the following year. Yeah. Came back and rode the warning, and then my, my left leg just... I don't know what happened. My left calf just stopped working. Yeah. It even atrophied a bit, like so it shrunk a bit. Yeah. Um, every nerve specialist, back specialist said, oh, yeah, it looks like there's nerve issues going on. You've got... Scan show you've got a prolapsed L45 in your spine. Really? But we can pull 100 people off the street and they've got a prolapsed disc. Yeah. And it can be just normal for them. So it, it was nothing was conclusive. So I ended up um, giving it away in 2000. And it was the most devastating thing that ever happened to me. And I remember... How old were you in 2000? So I was 24. 24, that's young still. No, and I was still... I still, for some reason, oh no, I suppose it's like a lot of athletes, I had no doubt in my mind I was going to be a world beater. Really? I had no doubt in my mind. So to have that, my cycling disappear, and I still don't know whether a lot of it was psychological, the whole injury, because I'm a big believer in psychosomatic yeah. issues, like if you've got a lot of turmoil in your life, all of a sudden your back goes. Yeah, right. Or something happens. So I don't know whether, if I had it continued on, I would have just gotten over it. Well, I, I sort of have gotten over it now. I'm back yeah. racing, do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. But I remember specifically, I had, a, I had a, a pro contract and I remember handing it to Hilton, my brother. Yeah. I was living with him at the time. Yeah. And I said, I can't go. My leg's not working. Here's, here's, a, here's your, give him a call. So that's how he got his American career started. So you obviously had some, some you know, a lot of resentment towards this and... I reckon I had, yeah, a lot of trauma. Yeah. Because I think, yeah, I think especially for an athlete whose identity, if your self-identity is I'm an athlete, I'm a cyclist, yeah, and then you're not anymore, yeah, what are you? Absolutely. It's, it was, yeah, pretty bad, but I've, I ended up um, finding a new group of mates. I, I walked into a nightclub one night and reappeared five years later. <laughs> <laughs> I had a good time, and I wouldn't I would never take that time back. It was, a, it was a fantastic time of my life. Finished my uni degree, got uh, started working in gyms as yeah. a fitness instructor, personal trainer. Yeah. And then I got into the pharmaceutical industry as a pharmaceutical rep, and started a family. And yeah. yeah. This photo I saw on Facebook, and you you must have been what a hundred. 100 kilos? I was pushing, it was about 95 kilos, so I'm about 68 kilo now. I think I always had um, deep down turmoil about losing my cycling. Yeah. I always think I had a, because of that I had a bit of a self-destructive personality. But I sort of got by, and I had, a, I had, an, had another, back in 2008, I had another club race again. I started club racing. Right. So that was in 2008. So, you, so you'd basically gone eight years. So that was eight years without racing. Right. And then I came back and I was winning A-grade crits again. Yeah. And I won the Carnegie Summer Series. Wow. Yeah. And then I'd already dealt with the turmoil. Well, this is how bad the turmoil was. I remember going, I hadn't stepped foot in a velodrome. Yeah. For about what eight years, so six years, yeah. I wouldn't go near a velodrome. Yeah, wouldn't even. I didn't want to know about a race. Didn't want to know about it. And my brother, when the junior world championships were in Melbourne, yeah, my brother Johnny was racing the junior world championships. Yeah. So I thought I'd better go and watch my brother ride. And I remember he rode the Madison with Chris Sutton. Yeah. And they came second. Wow. And it was awesome. They were. I think, it, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was second. And there was the happiest moments of his life. But this is how bad my state of mind was. I was devastated. Just to be at that, to be at the velodrome, to hear the crowd roaring. Yeah. It just gutted me. Did it? But I, and I was trying to hide it because I wanted to be happy for Johnny. Yeah. But that's that's the sort of that's where I was at. Yeah. Right. So in 2008, I had another club race again. And I was, I was going really well. Yeah. And uh, even went and rode the Bay Crits, did everything. 
And then at the end of that 2008, 2009 summer, this is what, I lost my cycling again because all of a sudden I couldn't sit on a, I couldn't sit on a bike anymore and feel comfortable. Yeah. I, uh, and it was mainly to, to do with, it's funny, I've, I haven't told this story to many people. Yeah. I uh, just couldn't sit on a bicycle saddle anymore. It actually was uncomfortable to sit on a bicycle saddle. I don't know what it was, I spent a small fortune buying saddles, messing with my position, uh, getting bike fits, what's going on? But every ride it felt like I'd, I'd just been kicked in the nuts. And, mm. and lo and behold, I had to walk away from cycling again. And I think that trauma, like that was that reliving my, my losing my cycling again. Yeah. And I just went into this deep depression and found solace in food, grog. I was smoking a packet of day ciggies. Unbelievable, I didn't yeah. know that. So that photo that you saw yeah. was me just going to the depths. Yeah. I don't know how I kept my marriage. Yeah. I was just terrible to live with. I, even looking back, I go even, I feel sad for my kids even just um, how they, I don't know, when they looked up to dad, what did they see? A sad man, I don't know. Anyway, so I got through, anyway, yeah, I don't know, I don't know when the turning point was, but one day my wife and I said, we have to lose weight. Um, I know what I did, I, um, I was unhappy in my job I was doing. I was overweight, I was smoking. I had no ambitions, I had no drive. I was seeing a psychiatrist. Um, and a lot of it to do with depression, I, uh, obsessive compulsive tendencies. I was on high dose antidepressants to the point where I felt numb. My mental health issues were self-destructive. Yeah. And what that meant by, I got to, to points where I thought I'm that unhappy and I'd almost say to myself, bring it on, what can I do to make myself more unhappy? Yeah. yeah. Bring it on, bring it on. I want more I want more pain. Smoking, eating, drinking, not doing things that you enjoy, or actually avoiding things you would enjoy. Yeah. Just being a sorry sack. The worst it got, I would be up all hours of the morning changing head stems, yeah. changing saddles with a measuring tape. And this being fueled by absolute Anxiety, almost to the point where I could hear a clock ticking. You have to get this fixed. You're going to lose your cycling. You're going to, you're going to lose your cycling. Panic. So I, my wife would get up at all hours in the morning and go, "What on earth are you doing?" And I'd be, I would be almost hysterically. I remember a few times just breaking down and sobbing like a baby. Okay, when you're an athlete, you train hard you dedicate your life to something and people like people that just have every day nine to five jobs can't understand the commitment that you have to have to do that yeah but then when you've got time off when you play hard when you play go out and play yeah you play hard as well there's no in between there's yeah. no so you you're training flat out but when you go out to a nightclub you annihilate yourself yeah and it's, it's like there's no off switch. Yeah, you don't know there's a you don't know the happy medium. Yeah. And I think that's why athletes tend to go out and get themselves into strife because they're used to going so hard towards a goal. They'll go out to a nightclub and yeah, I just go for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think it's just the athlete's obsessive um, drive. Yeah, that'll do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know my wife looked at me one day. And she read, and her story says she. I was looking straight through her. I wasn't looking at her. I was just look, was looking straight through her. She said, "This has got to stop." Yeah. And I said, "Yeah." Yeah. So, hey, I'm a success story. Like, who knows? Yeah. I could still be there. I don't. I can't exactly tell you how I got out of it, but I know finding my cycling back again. Yeah. Was a big answer, and that's why I think cycling is. Uh, so I hold so dear. Well, it's probably my best, over the years, it's probably been my best, my worst enemy and my best friend. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, you, you're back at winning races now. Mm. Um, you're down to, from... Well, I was pushing 95 depth down to 68 now. So, so 95 kilograms down to 68. Yeah. 
uh, winning A-grade races again. I mean, you can't get more of a success story than that, can you? No, and that's why I need to keep it in check because um, I can't have this being the reason why I'm happy. If you know, if you know what I mean. Like, so what? Tomorrow I st I'm not winning races anymore, and then I fall into that hole again. That's exactly right. So I think what I'm looking at my cycling now is my cycling is a um, it's my punching bag. Yeah. It's my it's my outlets. It's, I just use it as. Also, I love the I love the craft of cycling. Yeah. Yeah. So people play the violin or they play the guitar or I almost look at cycling as racing. It's a craft. And I, I just love I love going down the crits. I'm the I'm not in a team. I race one out and I use my craft and I love I love doing that. So yeah, yeah. and that's why I don't train anymore, because training means you're working towards something serious. Yeah. I ride because yeah. I don't want to put this racing as something serious. So I just put it down to I even my racing, I just, I'm riding. Yeah, yeah. I'm not racing. Yeah. I just go down and have a ride, and if I've crossed the line first, then yeah. so be it. You know, talking about training, you know, you've got a lot of coaches out there smashing young athletes, getting into their intervals and stuff like that. I have my opinions on that, but what are your, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, is, there, is that sustainable? Is that a sustainable way yeah. of... I think you've got to... Um, it all depends. If you love it, then that's sustainable. If you're not loving it, then no. I look back of when I was in the Victorian Institute of Sport. Um, I was a, I was overtraining. I remember times when I was track racing. Uh, there'd be days I'd do a ride in the morning. I'd go to gym in the after, in the at lunchtime, and I'd go do a track session in the afternoon. Now that's not sustainable. And I was tired. And now at the moment, I, I'm probably, a, I sometimes on the bike feel fitter than I ever was, even when I was back when I was in the Institute of Sport. Yeah. And I, like, I, I'll, I'll train one day, have a total day off the next day. Train one day, have a total day off. Then I only during the week, I'll only train on a Tuesday, Thursday. Yeah. And I might do a Saturday, Sunday, and that's about all I do. Yeah. And I feel better on yeah. the bike. Yeah. But um, I once asked um, Matty Lloyd, who used to ride for Lotto, yeah. about Philip Gilbert. I said, what's he like? And he goes, he just loves it. He'll go down the road and sprint to a pedestrian crossing like you and I would have a sprint down the pedestrian crossing and put his hands up in the air. And I think that's the, the key. If you love it, then keep doing whatever you're doing. But if, if Something's becoming mundane and monotonous. You need to mix it up. That's right. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good advice. Yeah. Since between, uh, well, since the the Instagram and Facebook post I did showing me seriously overweight and just looking downright sad, I've actually had um, about five people that I used to know in the cycling game Facebook message me, say, Troy, you're an inspiration, and I've been following you on Facebook. I haven't heard from these guys for years. Um, what is it that was able to get you out of that? Because I'm I'm going through the same sort of stuff. And if my story can help a few people, then I'm I'm happy with that. So, but there's a lot of people that are going through the same thing, and I think mental health's got this stigma of you can't talk about it. It's not as if you broke your arm and you got a plaster on your arm, but you are broke. You're more than broke. And you've got to put on a face that says I'm not broken. It's it's quite hard. Whereas a broken arm, you show the world that you've got plaster on your arm and you embrace it. It's it's so, so different. Yeah, yeah, so true. And this is the other thing with men is they can men aren't men generally aren't very good communicators. No, no. And I grew up. My dad. Um, I grew up with that male figure in my life. Dad, dad. We never spoke about feelings and stuff. And. Um, I think maybe things are changing now, but I think men still carry the burden of, I have to be the stronger one here and show that I'm coping. And if I'm not coping, I'm a loser. But it's not true. If you ask for help, you're not the loser. You're actually doing something for yourself, so. Great story. Yeah. Troy, thank you very much for your time, mate. Really appreciate it. Thanks, mate.
you must be stoked that you set a race record. Oh yeah, I come two years ago. I come second here by about a tyres width, and I the disappointment I had, and I always said I'd come back here and win it, and I've come back and won it. It's just amazing. I can't believe it. Now, how does it feel to be a part of Australian cycling history? Oh, it's. You can't describe it, it's just fantastic. Like names, I'm up there with Sid Patterson, Stephen Pate, guys like that. It's fantastic. And just lastly, how are you going to spend the money? Um, I think I might buy a car with it. I need a car. I've been riding everywhere. So, um, yeah, a car I'll put in the bank, one or the other. Well done, Troy. Thanks.